Hi, everybody. With me today is Taylor Hudick from Action for Assange. Hi, Taylor. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm very well. Now we're in a proper studio and I can record you and I've got help because as you <laughs> found out the other night, I'm not the most technically gifted person. Now, I wanted to speak to you about because obviously you've come over from America with the Action for Assange crew to cover the Assange trial down in Woolwich Court in Belmarsh Prison, correct? Yeah, you're correct. I came out here and I've been covering uh, this case starting on Monday. It lasted until Thursday. I was not present in the courtroom, but I was covering the case from outside the courtroom and was able to really see uh, a lot of the protests taking place. And then I would speak with uh, Tara Haddad, whom I was working with throughout this trip. He was able to uh, get access into the courtroom. So I kind of watched out for his tweets and watched out for uh, some of the information that he was uh, posting on social media and then kind of relayed the information. But the first day I was primarily focused on capturing all of the protests and all of the support that was being uh, seen outside the courthouse. Because we know, of course, that it's something that's not going to be highlighted in uh, corporate media. And unfortunately, this case in general, we've seen a media blackout uh, throughout all of the corporate media in the U.S., the U.K., and I'm sure elsewhere in the world. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the media, first of all, there, because it's something that has been a, a pet peeve of mine and one of the reasons why, I, um, why I've been covering this, this, this trial and this, this, uh, this situation so, um, so aggressively and so uh, uh, intimately is because I feel as if our media have fallen down in their duties to the fourth estate. Because in the years and the decades and the centuries to come, I believe that um, Julian Assange's name will be remembered um, in, for the same reason that we remember people like Albert Einstein and you know William Shakespeare and, and Marilyn Monroe, those kinds of people. I believe that he will be talked about in that vein in the future. And with those people, I'm sure that they, when they were around in their era, they had their detractors as well, I'm sure. William Shakespeare had people smearing and slandering him, so he would never come to him, amount to everything. Obviously, um, Marilyn Monroe had her detractors in the press. There were obviously column inches after inches after inches, miles written about her and her private life. And Albert Einstein, the same, he had his detractors. Nobody remembers their name. Uh, nobody remembers the the journalists who were who were detracting on these amazing people in in, in history. Uh, but they remember the amazing people. So for those people in the in the mainstream media, for the people like James Ball, who wrote that Julian, the only thing between Julian Assange in fr and freedom is pride, he just has to walk out the door, um, of which we know that's not the case. Um, people like uh, Luke Harding, uh, who have been smearing and slandering, and th then Luke Harding, I believe, even published a password, a 64-digit password of WikiLeaks that gave people access to troves of unredacted documents and then took no responsibility and just said, hey, they said they were going to change the password. So he's blamed WikiLeaks for publishing, a, for, for leaking documents of which he released the password for, which is really quite amazing. Nobody's going to remember those people. Nobody's going to, for instance, the person who I know in one press conference last year when uh, Kristen Ranson uh, talked about the sting operation with Spain and the UCI Global affair. One reporter actually said to him, well, if Julian Assange's condition inside the Ecuadorian embassy is so bad, why doesn't he just walk out and go into custody if it's going to better? That reporter, I've already forgotten his name. Nobody's going to remember their name, are they? But people are going to remember Julian Assange. And... The same fate awaits those journalists, the James Balls, the Luke Hart. Luke Harding might be remembered, but as a butt of a joke. Um, nobody's going to remember their names, same as nobody remembers the people who were detracting on Marilyn Monroe and William Shakespeare, etc. Um, now, as for the media, have you seen much down there at all from the mainstream this week? So on the first day, I did see CNN there for a b very brief time period. They were not there throughout the entire day, and they were certainly not there throughout the rest of the week. I My prediction was is that their coverage would consist of just a, a story that they would probably read 
where they have a series of stories that they just kind of touch on to highlight what's going on uh, throughout the world in like a world news uh, segment on their broadcast. And I think that's probably what had happened. Again, I'm not in the U.S. right now, yeah. nor am I watching CNN ever. So I'm not actually sure of their nature of their coverage. I will look into that um, in the coming weeks to kind of see uh, perhaps what they were saying about this case. I know that we were talking earlier about somebody wrote uh, an article just talking about sort of the uh, the, the media blackout mm -hmm. with this case. But I think we all anticipated that to happen, yeah. which is the very reason why I decided to come out here to begin with, because I knew that there wasn't going to be uh, much fair coverage. Now, there has been a group of journalists um from the U.S. and the U.K., independent, of course, who have come out here and have done a really, really good job uh, to, to cover this case and to um, highlight what's going on in the courtroom and also outside the courtroom. But it was really interesting to see the overwhelming amount of support for Assange outside the courtroom. Yeah. And it was a very peaceful demonstration. It wasn't this... Uh, erratic or violent uh, protest. It was very peaceful. There were 150 French yellow vests there showing their support, and they were going strong all day long. And I was really amazed that even throughout the rain and the horrible mm -hmm. weather, they were still going strong to show this is a huge assault on the First Amendment. And also, too, it's a it, it sets a horrible precedent for uh, press freedoms in the future, which goes back to the point that you were mentioning is the fact that why do these journalists in the corporate media not understand that Assange's fate is inherently tied to theirs? Yeah, I, have a I have a theory about this. I have, a f I have a theory as to why they are so quiet on things because you've got to understand for nine years they've been leading a campaign of hate and smear sure. campaign against him saying he's a rapist. If all of a sudden they come out and <laughs> tell the truth, their entire audience are going to say, well, hold on a minute, you've been lying to us for 10 years then, haven't they? So they can't do a complete U-turn right now and, and, and report on things correctly, it seems to me at least. Uh, because they'll, it'll make them look like fools. And what we've seen over the week, I don't know, have you seen any of the UK media uh, uh, coverage of this so far this week? I have not. Um, I've been watching the BBC, because I've been out of it, obviously, back in Wolverhampton, but I've been keeping an eye on, I mean, your reports have been fantastic. It really has. And it's, it's, such, um, it's so important then that you've done what you've done, because we need to make sure that there's a record there of actually what happened. Because you saw on Tuesday, I think there was revelations about um, uh, Julian Assange being offered a pardon for um, for saying it wasn't the Russians. Now, he said this many times before, but nevertheless, the headlines in the media, in the BBC, were Assange often pardon for saying it wasn't the Russians. That wasn't the case, though, was it, Taylor? No, that wasn't the case. Um, they were trying to get him to provide actual evidence of who the source was for the DNC leaks. And of course, he is not going to do that mm -hmm. because source protection is a very important component of the WikiLeaks model and something very important to Assange and his journalism where they've gone to great lengths to protect sources. And he also knows, I'm sure, that if he were to reveal this source and provide uh, concrete evidence of who uh, provided those leaks, that the whole operation WikiLeaks as a publication would have lost uh, trust from the public and yeah. from potential from potential whistleblowers. And then also, too, we were discussing this uh, yesterday, the fact that he would not necessarily have proof of that source, the way that the the, the Dropbox is set up. Yeah, it, it, things can be dropped dropped to him anonymous, uh, anonymously. I, I, I'm not sure whether he knows who the source is. That's the point I'm trying to make. But he, he does say over and over, doesn't he, that it wasn't the Russians. And he said this over and over. I mean, I, I remember when the revelations came out, I think it was Tuesday, um, I, I just tweeted something out saying, he's, he said it wasn't Russia many times. It's not, it's not just Several one. Several months prior. Yeah, and it, it, he said it, I think years ago, he said it wasn't the Russians. And, I remember seeing an interview with him, uh, I think it was on RT, it might have been with Afshin Ritanzi, where he was saying that the DNC server, the DNC, um, their cyber security was like Swiss cheese. You know, there were probably many actors that hacked into the DNC, but that's not where we got our information from. So he said it over and over and over and over. Um, and then I read, I think, something from Susie, Susie Dawson yesterday saying, no, 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 actually the pardon wasn't for revealing that it wasn't. Russia, 
it was actually revealing his source. That was the main thing. And obviously, as you say, it can't. This is something he can't do because it'll discredit the whole WikiLeaks model, won't it? Absolutely, it will. And uh, WikiLeaks is an organization that has gone to great lengths to protect sources and uh, political dissidents. And the Courage Foundation, of course, who raises money to help those who are in some legal trouble, people who have uh, blown the whistle on abuses of power, is very much tied to WikiLeaks. And I believe at one time uh, some staff members were very much involved in the Courage Foundation. Um, but it seems also on Tuesday we learned – um, to, to kind of build off of abuses of power, we also learned that the CIA was considering uh, ending the situation at the embassy. I mean, that's as polite as I can put it, really. But they basically were thinking of uh, of a way to potentially assassinate yeah. Assange, which is which should be outraged, which should have people outraged, but nobody is is really touching. Of course, on this. and I, I, this is a, a question I want to ask you. What's the difference between assassinating somebody in an Ecuadorian embassy and chopping somebody up in a Turkish embassy like yeah, Saudi Arabia are alleged, are alleged to do? I mean, the, the Washington Post and the entire media in America came out in absolute disgust at what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. Here's evidence that the United States are planning to do it to a journalist in this country. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? Yes, and um, of course, what happened to uh, Khashoggi was horrible. Absolutely, of course, absolutely awful. It should be uh, condemned. The United States should one hundred percent put some repercussions on uh, Saudi Arabia for for this, and we're we're not really seeing that. But also, too, the U.S. has historically oh, I don't been very know. reluctant. He had a trial. He had a trial over in Saudi Arabia. They they found the culprits, didn't they? According to the media, right. that's what they say. They had a trial and they found the culprits. Sorry, carry on. Well, the U.S. has historically been very quick to point out the faults in human rights abuses and abuses of power in other countries, specifically Russia, China, mm -hmm. Iran. However, when it comes to U.S. journalists and their persecution or just Western journalists in general within the Five Eyes countries, they do not want to highlight that or talk about it. I mean, look at what happened to Max Blumenthal. Clearly a situation where he was being uh, targeted and mm -hmm. uh, accused of assault. Be, and this is clearly a retaliation because of his reporting on uh, Venezuela and the coup that was taking place there but there's nobody in the corporate media who's touching on this this is something that happens uh, very frequently yeah there, there's wider repercussions as well not just um at home in the u.s and in the uk obviously for journalists but also going after a journalist like this uh and trying to extradite so literally just trying to put your hand into another you know one of the biggest countries in the world and pluck a journalist out and slam him in you know jail for 175 years it's it's sending a message to not just other journalists around the world to say, listen, we can get you anywhere if you become a problem, but also it's sending a message to other authoritarian regimes that, listen, all bets are off now, um, because obviously Bolsonaro went after Glenn Greenwald, didn't he, not long ago? Yes, and I even said when that happened that the U.S. prosecuting Assange and uh, charging him specifically with the conspiracy to commit computer intrusion charge, which was very similar to what uh, Greenwald was charged with. Mm -hmm. I believe that the U.S. actions really empowered the uh, Brazilian government to then go after Glenn Greenwald. And I've said this many times before on the Watchdog podcast and I think in an interview with you as well, that human rights abuses in the West are often used to justify human rights abuses elsewhere. If mm -hmm. the United States is doing it, it makes it seem like it's a an okay thing to do. Because, of course, we are living in a a U.S. empire, of course. no doubt. And we're seeing that's this case is evidence of that as well, because the U.K. is very much afraid, I think, to not grant the U.S. this extradition because of the potential backlash they'll receive from it. Well, if you look at the situation at the moment, we've got a trade deal to do with America exactly. that they can't be that they can't the, the boat can't be rocked. Um, and it is being rocked severely at the moment. We'll come back to how it's being rocked, because I'm sure you, you know where I'm going with that. But I want to talk to uh, we, I want to 
first of all get back to you on the ground on Monday. You come over, and I want to want to talk to you about what was the crowd like. Was the and also not just what was the support for the crowd, but I've seen videos sent to me of people. Um, you know, there's a main road outside Belmarsh. It's a dual carriageway. Uh, it's very busy, and people were holding up signs saying "Honk if you believe in justice," and people were honking their horns and putting their thumbs up. And what was the atmosphere like down uh, like? like down there on Monday? So on Monday, I was uh, mainly focused and kind of standing amongst others in the crowd right outside of the prison and right outside of Woolwich Crown Court. I did make it to the streets a few days later, and that's when I saw a lot of people walking back and forth, and they had signs out and uh, chanting things like, free Julian Assange, no U.S. extradition. But mainly on Monday, it was uh, really amazing to see the uh, diligence among the protesters there. Now, to get specifically into some of the interactions between the police there and the protesters, it was mainly uh, peaceful. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were a few uh, exchanges that were maybe a little bit testy that you would typically expect with any demonstration or yeah. any protest. I did see some officers like pulling people off of the ground. The reason for that was because this protest was taking place where uh, cars were able to pass through to get in yeah. and out of the parking lot in front of the uh, courthouse. And so they needed vehicles to be able to go back and forth and, and have a way to get through that area. And so at, out of protest, in showing support for Assange and against U.S. extradition, protesters were sitting down mm -hmm. in this area and the police would tell them, please get up, and they wouldn't move. And so then they would kind of pick them up. But it wasn't anything that was too dramatic or, or, or violent in any way. And eventually everybody did listen to what the police were saying and they set up barricades and they had the protesters get behind the barricades so there was a clear path. Yeah. And any time that I had my camera out or was trying to walk around and get footage, uh, I was immediately asked, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You have to get behind the barricade. And I just kind of kept uh, filming because mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to uh, qu quit filming. But I, yeah. I I still got my footage, and um, I don't have a, an international uh, press pass, so my being a journalist and telling them that doesn't really hold any weight. But I was still able to get footage. And as the day progressed... Things seem to get um, less uh, hostile, I guess, with the uh, police. But again, I don't want to talk like too much about my being there, more yeah. about what I saw. And what I saw was just overwhelming support in a very concerted effort to show that support. I did the, the, the stuff with the police. I, I just want to want to. But that was actually very what I heard that was going on this week with the police. They were very good, actually, from what I heard. Um there have been times that I've witnessed, especially at uh, Westminster Magistrates Court, of them being quite antagonistic to, towards protesters. And I didn't hear any reports of that this time at all. In fact, I heard reports of them turning up with sweets and jelly beans and giving out jelly beans to the crowd. So, you know, at least at least the people, the, the, the one person I spoke to said, said the words, actually was, they did seem very... Um, sympathetic to what we were doing and you know they were just trying to get on with their job so it's, it's good that you brought that up because he did, i would say that the police presence down there this week has been really quite good from the reports that i've seen so i'm glad you brought that up but um one of the things i wanted to ask you about as well was this honking of the horns uh on the road outside because it's quite a a, a a busy road there were quite a lot of horns being beat weren't there weren't there Oh, yeah, there were, which is really uh, a testament to show that people are learning more about this case. They're familiar yeah. with what's happening and that they support Assange and are against this U.S. extradition. Yeah, and even, though, the, really even though there's a media blackout, it's still get people still really know what's going or enough people know what's going on. So if, if you know, it really does hit the fan, then, um, you know, word will spread pretty quickly, I would have thought. Um, there was something else this week with regards to revelations about um, UCI Global over in Spain, wasn't there? Um, uh, they were spying on him. Um, did that come up in court this week? Yes, it did come up in court that uh, UC Global was basically being employed by the CIA, U.S. intelligence. Yeah, and this is, this is when he was in the Ecuadorian embassy. Correct. This is when this was Julian was in the Ecuadorian embassy. And this is, is it after he was gagged or just shortly before in, I think, 2017? It was only the last couple of years, wasn't it? 
um, and they they had him under surveillance in every room and the CIA had access to the server, didn't they? Yes, everything was being sent to uh, the CIA and U.S. intelligence, which is extremely problematic for the case, of course, because Assange had communications with his attorneys and with his doctors while in the embassy, and those communications were being intercepted and being uh, broadcast for members of U.S. intelligence to hear about and to to learn more information about uh, maybe what the defense was planning. So therefore, his attorney-client privilege was breached, which in any other case would have been sufficient to throw this case out of court. Of course, that's not what's happening because all regard for the law in this case has been largely uh, ignored and, and thrown out the window, really. And um, I was talking to uh, the editor-in-chief of the Duran and former attorney, Alex McCurris, yesterday, who said that, and he goes into it in a greater depth and in our interview, but he says that uh, he lays it all out where he says there are certain procedures that should be taking place that would be in favor of the defense that we've seen in British courts where the judge will rule in, in favor of the defendant on certain motions. And that is just not taking place mm-hmm. in this case. And I asked him, well, what makes this different? And of course, you would imagine what his answer was it's because the U.S. Uh, wants this man. Mm-hmm. The, the and pressure there's on him. Pressure. Um, I, I want to come back to the 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 the, uh, the the law aspect, that, especially that you're meeting with Alexander McCurvis. He will know more than me about that, especially the extradition act. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you were talking there about his treatment. Um, you brought up uh, his treatment and the way the prosecution of. Um, uh, almost what we did, it was going to get thrown out of court. Now, this is because he's been held in a glass box, isn't it? At the uh, at the back of the court, I believe. I believe it's in the back of the court, or he's separated from the rest of the gallery. So throughout this hearing this past week, um, Assange was in a glass box. He was not able to sit with his attorney. Mm-hmm. So his attorneys eventually filed a motion to allow him to sit next to well, them yeah, he can't, during the court hearing. They can't pass notes. He can't pass can't notes between them. Because they can't communicate in a confidential manner. So they did request for that, and it was uh, denied very abruptly by the judge. And Alexander McCurris even said that uh, the layout of the courtroom and sort of the atmosphere of what's taking place in the courtroom does hold some weight as to whether or not he is receiving a fair hearing in this case. Mm -hmm. So he said it could be something that could be brought up on appeal. Let's hope we don't have to uh, appeal. Let's hope... Let's hope it doesn't get to that point. But either side will, um, with regard to regardless of who the judge uh, chooses to rule in favor of. Um, there is also the um, there is also the the case at the moment with Ansacoulis, and I know that some people don't like bringing this up because Ansacoulis is a, a CIA. A spy CIA analyst who is married to another CIA analyst who uh, drove out of an RAF base, one of the, the American bases over here, and hit a young guy on the wrong side of the road. She was driving on the wrong side of the road, killed him. His name was Harry Dunn. I think he was 19 years old. He was on his motor- motorbike. And now the reports I'm getting are, are confusing. Some say the official line in the media is that she spoke with police and then she said that she wasn't going to leave and go back to the United States. And she did. There were other reports saying, no, she left the scene of the accident and went. Um, so it's uh, we don't know. There's so much disinformation out there at the moment. We don't know what's true and what's not. But one thing's for sure, she went back to the United States when she shouldn't have. And we've asked for an extradition of her to the UK and the United States have said, no, no, we're not going to do it. Now, this is somebody who, now I'm sure she's very upset at this. I'm sure that she didn't it didn't mean to kill this person, but this is a case of death by dangerous driving. This is a case of, at the very minimum, I would say death by, uh, without due care, driving without due care and attention, of which there should be repercussions. I'm not saying that she should go to, go to jail for 10, 15, 20 years, but she is responsible here for killing a person. There's no two ways about it. The prosecution in America during the, during the Chelsea Manning case argued, they admitted that Julian Assange, his releases and WikiLeaks releases have never resulted in the death of anybody. Yet they just flat out refuse in America to refuse. Yet we've got this farce going on right now in, in Woolwich Court 
which I heard Lee Camp say to call it a kangaroo court at the moment, uh, uh, to call that a kangaroo court is an act, is a smear on kangaroos. It's um, it does highlight the whole um, the hypocrisy of it all, doesn't it? And they just want this person because at the end of the day, he revealed that they were war criminals who were all guilty of being war criminals. Isn't that correct? Oh, absolutely. And to to go back to the case that you were referring to, and I'm not completely knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the specifics of what took place, but I know that this woman's husband has some uh, ties to intelligence, and I think that it's fair to say that is a huge factor into yeah. why she is being uh, treated differently and why she is not having to be, uh, or is not being extradited at least at this point and was, able, was not jailed immediately, et cetera. I think we could say that. And then also probably because the U.K. is asking the U.S. to extradite this person. I think that may be another factor. But, of course, this is a retaliation for good journalism. This is to send a message to others that if you expose U.S. war crimes or anything that embarrasses mm -hmm. some powerful people in the West, you, too, will go down like Julian Assange. Well, how they want him to go down. Yeah. He's not there yet. Uh, and I think that. We're going to keep fighting to ensure that does not happen. And uh, the facts are very much on the side of the defense. But essentially, that's what the U.S. wants, is they want to be able to make an example out of out of him. And I believe it was uh, Kristen Raffinson, the editor in chief of WikiLeaks, who said that this was a political persecution, not a prosecution. Yeah, persecution. I'm, I want to I want to come to that because um, you said, Christopher Robinson, I, I've been following the work of Nils Meltzer, as you have, who's the United Nations um, rapporteur on, on torture. He's the expert on torture. And he says that this is the collective persecution, of the ganging up of, of four democratic states, superpowers, uh, on one side and on the other, a mere mortal, a man. And um, he says that this is the psychological torture of him. Um, I can't imagine what this man has gone through for the last 10 years. And the judge referred to it in the trial as a condition, didn't she? Mm -hmm. His condition, he's taking medication for his condition. Well, his condition is psychological torture and the effects of psychological torture. Nils Meltzer has said that this is not torture light. This is torture, torture, torture. It's incredibly bad. And... What they're doing to him is clearly breaking him down, isn't it? Or trying to break him. Yes, that's what they've been trying to do for years now. That's why the conditions in the Ecuadorian embassy here in London, prior uh, to his, of course, being arrested there, while he was living there, they tried to worsen the conditions. They took away his to, razor. That's exactly. why he, he had the, beard, the long beard, because they took away his razor. And then they made fun of his long beard in the media when, he, when they dragged him out in the act of fascism. Right. Yes, they did. And they tried to or they did worsen the conditions in that embassy with the hopes that he would walk out on his own. Because at that point, for everybody that's watching at that point, we all knew that there was U.S. charges, but we weren't 100 percent certain for some time until November of 2018. We did learn that there were charges. But for a while, we highly suspected that there were and we were right all along. But basically, the people were arguing, why doesn't he just walk out? Uh, but they've been wanting to get him to. To, to kind of leave on his own, and he hasn't. And I, I think that I couldn't... Right, we, we can't imagine the what he's been going through. And uh, like you said, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melzer, has officially reported that this is torture that he's been experiencing. The UK government has failed to conduct an impartial investigation, which they are obligated to yeah. under law. They failed to do that. They're not taking this seriously. If and then also weren't... another point, I do want to bring this up because this is really a uh, key here, was that Niels Melzer, who who went and visited Assange, of course, and, can, and, and looked into his situation and officially reported it was torture, he was somebody that was actually skeptical of Assange. Yeah. And he was a little bit reluctant at first to kind of look into his situation because of some of the smears he heard and things he heard about WikiLeaks. He believed it like so many other people. And then he finally decided to then go ahead and look into his situation and realize that there's been a huge disinformation campaign going on. So if you look at this, there more people can turn around 
and go and, and come to the right side of this issue like Niels Melzer has. And I thought it was really uh, brave of him to to really come out and speak about how he became involved in, in this case. And he was, in fact, somebody who was not really a a big uh, fan yeah. of Assange and then he realized certainly, he was lied to. He certainly get, didn't go into it with um, with any... Uh, warmth for Julian Assange at all. In in fact, he, I think he went into it thinking, oh, "I don't really want to do this because of, you know I can see that." But he's 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 come around to thinking that this is really collective persecution. You mentioned his the, the report there from the United Nations that um, because of his report, the very minimum that we should we don't have to do anything about it in the UK. We don't have to, but the bare minimum we have to do is open an investigation into it. And we haven't done that. And if we weren't a United Nations member and we were applying to be a United Nations member, we would be rejected because we haven't done the bare minimum of opening up that uh, that um, report, which does fly in the face, doesn't it, of all the other MPs and politicians who say, oh, no, we have to rescue this country because the United Nations said this about it and the United Nations said that about Syria and this about Yemen and et cetera. They use the reports when it suits them and then they just ignore them when they don't, don't they? Oh, of course. When it came out that... Uh, Trump had offered Assange a pardon for uh, saying it wasn't Russia. The BBC reported this and just reported it and said, "This is the, the that's the headline. This is what happened." At no stage in that report did they say, "Like I just retweeted out." He said that many, 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 many times before. They didn't put that in the article at all. I mean, this is just an absolute abdication of the fourth estate and their, their duties, isn't it? Yes, and U.S. media actually took it a step further where they used it as an opportunity to reiterate uh, Russiagate, and they, their headlines were such that they read uh, something along the lines of Trump offers pardon uh, to Assange in exchange for lying that Russia was not the source of the DNC hacks, of the DNC hacks. Like, it was totally off, and I thought, oh, my gosh, it's been a year, like, since we've learned this. I think it's been a year since the Mueller report came out, or, or some time now. We know, like, we know that Russia was not involved in this at all, and anybody who is able to think for themselves knew that before this investigation was it concluded anyway. But yeah, they used it as an opportunity to further push this uh, Russian narrative, which is uh, extremely offensive, I think, to people of Russian origin. We don't talk about that enough. This hysteria yeah. is, is actually incredibly offensive. And to call out people for being Russian and, and making jokes about it is just extremely offensive and it's continuing on. But there are rewards for doing this, of course. And also the media always needs there to be an enemy. That's how you get good ratings. They always need a, a, an enemy. Yeah, they, they, they need to have their scary person abroad so they can have their five minutes of hate. If you've mm -hmm. ever watched George Orwell, <laughs> you've read George Orwell, you know what I mean. Um, I, I do want to... Uh, there was something else I, I, I wanted to talk about, and I, I've just forgotten what it was. Um, what what other things have struck you this week? What other things um, do you um, do you think need to be highlighted this week that you found and need to report on? Yeah, so we did learn that, uh, of course, Chelsea Manning is yeah. very much tied uh, to this case and her associations with Julian Assange, and that was brought up in court. And essentially what we found, and I'm putting this in a very uh, basic way, but what they brought up in court, the defense, was that uh, Chelsea Manning was communicating with Assange uh, to break into that computer, mm -hmm. not to access uh, classified material, but basically just how to gain access for entertainment purposes with like video games music, just for entertainment purposes. So the U.S. Uh, argument here and their assumption was based off of something that was completely false. Okay. So 175 years for hacking a, a Xbox 360 password. <laughs> That's what they wanted to charge yes. you for. Um, the, the, the Chelsea Manning, you brought up Chelsea Manning, she's been, is it correct that she's being fined? She, $1,000 a day. She, she is now up to... 
it had every day, uh, every Wednesday on the vigils, we always make note of how much she's up to in fines. Mm. And we haven't had the vigils this past week, but I believe before we left off uh, about two weeks ago, it was over. A, it was just about a quarter of a million dollars in fines. So she's basically receiving a, a double punishment here because she is in prison. And this is all because of her. uh her, she won't testify. She won't testify before a grand jury investigating WikiLeaks, which is a perjury trap, by mm -hmm. the way, because there's no way that she would be able to repeat exactly what she said in court prior. Plus, they don't even need her to testify in court because they already have the transcripts. Yeah. But what they're trying to do is that they're trying to get her to say something that sort of discredits the defense's claim that this this association and communication between she and Assange was to access uh, video games. Mm -hmm. I think that's where they're trying to... To kind of put some doubt into that argument, but she is also an incredibly strong person because it would be very easy to just kind of uh, go ahead and and give them what they want so she could live a, a free life. And they already gave her her taste yeah. of freedom uh, not too long ago when uh, former President Obama uh, commuted her sentence. But remember, it wasn't a pardon; it was just a commuting of her sentence. So she was still able to go back to prison, and that's where she is now for refusing to testify. I, I she also cited that she does not agree with the grand jury process, which is a very uh, – it, it's a huge government overreach in the U.S. I mean, grand juries are close to the public. You cannot – it, the public doesn't have a right to access anything that that takes place during the grand jury process. Yeah, the um, we'll come on to the grand jury grand jury uh, in a minute. It, 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 I did. I remember a lot of people asking at the time, why did Obama commute the sentence and not pardon her? A lot of people ask that question. And my friend Andrew Smith and my colleague, uh, we co-founded Action for Assange together. He has a great. Uh, kind of theory behind this that I want to give him full credit for this. Okay. Andrew said that he thinks that this was something, and he could explain it better than I can, but but he saw it as a way to sort of give her her taste of freedom to say, mm -hmm. oh, don't you like this freedom? You've been in jail for so long. Well, here's what it's like to, to be on the outside and live a normal life. Then hit her with that. Yeah. We are summoning you to testify this, to testify before this grand jury in the hopes that she would be so reluctant to want to go back to prison that she would just give in and uh, testify. That, okay. that, that's his theory. And again, he, could, he can explain it better, but I think it's, uh, it it's makes quite sense. likely. It yeah. It's quite likely that, you know, that, that he, did, he didn't pardon her for a reason. He commuted her for a reason when it, everybody was saying, well, why doesn't he just pardon her? Um, you mentioned the grand jury. <clears throat> if Julian Assange is extradited from these shows, which they, I, I swear I will chain myself to those railings. They're not going to take him away. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm not going to be the only one who's going to do that. There's going to be plenty of us. If that, if it comes to that, hopefully it won't. But if he is extradited to the United States, he faces a grand jury. Now, I want to ask you. This is a totally secret court in Virginia, isn't it? And that's where Langley is, the CIA. So everybody in the area of where this court is is all either. CIA or has friends with CIA or two family members removed from CIA or, or correct? You're exactly right. He would be uh, tried in the U.S. Eastern District Court of Virginia. It is known as the Espionage Court. John Kiriakou mm -hmm. uh, spoke with the Free Assange Vigil crew uh, several months ago where he said Assange would in no way be subjected to a fair trial in this court. There is a 100% conviction rate for mm -hmm. anybody tried in this court for espionage-related cases. And the, gr the jury would be comprised of intel, people who have very close relationships to uh, intel or, or former intel. So, again, you have a very uh, prejudicial jury. Also, the jury would not be able to hear much of the evidence presented in the case because it's considered sensitive or classified. And then also code words <laughs> would be used to reference other uh, other things. So they would use, like, um, airplane to reference a certain uh, document. Or so mm -hmm. It's just a very, very confusing court. And uh, his case would be under SEPA, and I can't... Uh, the exact wording of what that acronym uh, stands for is escaping me right now, but it's along the lines of... It, it being a national security case where it would be closed off from the public. So it's a total myth and a lie when 
some people say, well, we need Assange to, to come to the United States because then all the truth will come out and we'll learn about all of our corrupt governments. That's just not the case. None of the information would be uh, presented. It's it's really key here that there is no yeah. U.S. extradition. Yeah, you mentioned John Kiyaku. Uh, John Kiriaki, for those who don't know, is the only person to go to prison in the United States for their torture program that we found out through WikiLeaks, correct? Um, the torture program, we obviously will see the horrific pictures from Abu Ghraib. And John Kiriaki was the only person who went to, to prison for that torture program. And um, he was the one who revealed it, wasn't he? Um, yeah, John, John Kiriaki. Um, he mentioned that the judge over in the in Virginia who presides over that court, that court, all of the um, extradition and the espionage, etc., uh, cases she holds for herself. John Kriaki was saying that, and she's always prosecuted. They've got really no chance of having a fair trial over there. And also, what I found out through John Kriaki is it's right that he has no, if he is extradited to that court. And they present all this evidence to him with passwords, et cetera, and, and code words. The audience is picked, the, the, sorry, the jury is picked from people in that area who all mingle with people from the intelligence area and CIA, et cetera. Um, he also has no right of reply to the evidence that they bring to him. Is that correct? Yes. So he would be prevented from being able to explain his reasoning as to why he chose to publish this information. So things such as like, oh, this was for the greater good or for the public's right to know his motive, that can't be brought up in court. It cannot at all. Cannot. And can can he refute things that the, the other side allege against him? Or has he just got no right of reply? I would have to imagine that his defense has to be able to have their own arguments, of How course, would we know it's a secret court? But how would we know what's really <laughs> taking place in this court? It, right, because it is, uh, the media won't be there. It's cut off from the public. And it's not because that they don't want to cover this case, but because legally it's a private type of case. Mm -hmm. And also his attorneys as well would be uh, prevented from knowing much of the information and much of the evidence that's being uh, put forth. Yeah, of course. I want to move on to some, I want to move on to your one of your, Whole, the subject you hate, politicians. What, what support has he had from the politicians over in America? Yes, you're right in saying that I am uh, not a fan of talking about electoral politics, but it's important to talk anymore. about the um, to talk about these uh, individuals because they do have the power to help Assange's situation and to uh, potentially free him. The only so back in the U.S., uh, and I'm sure everybody knows this, of course, it's covered quite a bit. Back in the U.S., we're in a pretty intense election right now. Mm -hmm. And um, out of the candidates, the mainstream candidates, uh, Tulsi Gabbard is the only one to come out and say that she will drop the charges against Julian Assange. The others have kind of not really answered the question directly or they haven't uh, or they just choose not to answer it at all or say that they will not drop the charges against him. Again, I want to take this moment to credit uh, Dak Rouleau of yeah, Overwritten. Dak. Yeah, I have to do this. Uh, Dak Rouleau of Overwritten.org. I, I have to give him credit here because really he's been out there questioning all of the candidates, getting right up in there in asking them if they will drop these charges, if they will pardon Assange. And again, he is from New Hampshire, and he is of overwritten.org. He also just launched a uh, YouTube show, The Overwritten Report, with my friend and colleague, uh, Christy Doff. Um, but they, but, but he has talked to the candidates, and he has a whole archive and, and library of video footage where he confronts the candidates, and you can see their response. And make of it what you will. Uh, but Tulsi Gabbard is the only one who has been able to say for certain that she would drop these charges. Sanders is one that um, I've spoken quite a bit about and been very critical of his inability to answer this question. Yet at the same time, I do see this as a much larger issue. This is a systemic problem that a U.S. presidential candidate feels fearful that he cannot speak out about the biggest press freedom case of the modern era yeah. because of the potential political consequences he may receive because of doing so. I think that's hugely problematic, but it's important to politely and respectfully put the pressure on candidates and the people that 
uh, can free Julian. But I think that the at least my focus is to uh, cover this case in a fair way to show what's really happening and to make sure that's a part of the historical record. Yeah, with with regards to Bernie, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned that what happens if he does becomes president, you know, what he said and the little he said now, really, it plays into the fact that, he, I mean, it just seems to me like he's going to be co-opted and molded and to do what the establishment want. Whereas, at least with Trump, when, at least when he was on the campaign train back in 2016, he was just pointing people out and saying, no, you're a crook, you're a crook, you gave him money, you gave him money, um, you know, you're only laughing because you're his donor. And, you know, Bernie's not doing that. So I don't, I get the feeling that he's just, you know, just from the outside, it's, it seems like uh, he's weak on it. And the only, it seems like they're all weak. And the only one who is strong on it is Tulsi. I just wanted to ask that. I know you don't like politicians. Right. And I but don't. I do want to also make note with Sanders is that his supporters consistently make excuses for him not answering this question. They also claim that this is not a, an important issue and it's not a, a, a key winning issue, which if you've listened to all of this podcast, you should know that this is an important issue. And actually, I did an interview with Max Blumenthal of The Gray Zone where he said that Sanders absolutely needs to stand up and needs to address this case and that he also sees this, and that's Blumenthal, even sees this as a winning issue for Sanders. So also for people watching, if you support Bernie Sanders, know that he gets his money, of course, from the people. Yeah. He doesn't get it from these big corporations, which means that he's really obligated to listen to his supporters. And so there's a unique opportunity to push him in the right direction on this issue. So if he's hearing from his supporters that they want him to support Assange and free him and drop these charges, he he's more likely to listen than these other candidates who get their money from bigger corporations who obviously have an interest in in Assange being extradited to the U.S. Of course. Um, now, this this trial was split. Now, I, I seem to remember the, st the trial was split into two segments. It, it was, was it a timing issue from one of the barristers couldn't make it or something like that? Is that Last why it was split heard, into two? Yeah, so it is. Yeah, for people watching, this, uh, this full extradition hearing is split into two parts. The first week just took place. This is just the beginning, though, and it will resume May 18th and is expected to last an additional three weeks. I believe there is another, like, one-day hearing that will take place on April 7th, but the full extradition hearing will resume May 18th for three weeks, and we should be learning a lot more during that hearing and we should be provided with some more evidence of this case. I mean, this was just the beginning. Yeah, I was very, um, I was heartwarmed when I found out that, that they had earmarked four weeks because they originally only earmarked a week for it, didn't they? And they, they had to extend it for four weeks. Now, I, I think, my feeling is that they extended it for four weeks because of public pressure. Um, and they couldn't sweep everything under the rug in one. And they, I think they realised that there were wider implications here, not just for the fourth estate, but for, you know, its role in dem a democracy, etc. Last so I, I heard, his attorneys needed some additional time to prepare okay. for the case. But it's going to go, it's, it's, you say it's May the 18th, it's going to start, you're going to be back over for that? I will. Excellent. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. You can um, obviously now Taylor and the Action for Assange crew. You are entirely funded by your audience, aren't you? Yes. From do donations, as am yes. I. We are truly independent. Where can people find you, Taylor? Yeah. So uh, before I let everybody know where they can find me, I want to uh, just give a a lot of. Uh, appreciation and also highlight the work of my colleagues, uh, Steve Poikinen, Christy Doff, and Andrew Smith, who were back in the U.S. They were in D.C. holding a series of protests, live streaming. Um, I want to give them so much credit for doing that. It is so important stateside that there is meaningful actions going on, and they have some awesome interviews, which you could find on YouTube at Action, the number four Assange. Um, I co-founded the organization with Andrew Smith, and I want to thank our viewers and everybody who donated uh, to help get me out here because I could not have made it out here without those uh, donations and that support. So I'm really, really grateful for that. I have so much footage to go out. Uh, 
not nearly all of it is up there yet. I have a, quite a bit of editing to do, but I look forward to getting it out there. And I want to thank everybody for uh, supporting us and helping us make it to London and also to D.C. And um, it, it was it was really important that I come out here. It really was important that you came out mm-hmm. here. I couldn't be there because of a, a family issue. And I knew that if you hadn't been there, the chances of us really having an independent voice there that we could trust who was documenting things and documenting with with Thank contacts you. on the inside. It's really important that we get the information out and we accurately report on this. And that's what you've been doing because mm-hmm. history will remember this. I, also I know wanted... they're trying not to, but history is going to remember this. Oh, it... yes. This case is uh, a monumental case. And mm-hmm. I also have... I also want to thank a few others. I want to thank uh, Tara Kadad, who yes. I worked with. We also have uh, podcasts and other uh, footage and articles that are published through the watchdog.net. That is with uh, Tara Kadad. It was a pleasure working with him and the entire London team. I am so grateful for everyone that I worked with out here. I mean, it was fantastic, and I cannot thank them enough. I look forward to working with everybody again in May. And also the footage is on uh, the Watchdog, which is on YouTube. And I also want to thank uh, my friend and colleague Kit Clarenberg for basically being by my side this whole time filming stuff for me because it was just me out here. And uh, he was right there filming, helping me prepare content and doing the production side of things. So a big thank you to Kit as well and um, my crew. And again, our vigils, we hold free Assange vigils every Wednesday evening at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you're in Europe, if you're in the UK, it's a little bit late for you guys. Uh, but it is archived on our YouTube channel. You can channel, always catch it on a Which is Action for Assange. And you can follow me on Twitter at underscore Taylor Hudak. And I personally want to say thank my friend Drew, who's behind the microphones there, who set, set this up for us. Thanks very much, for my mate. I'll leave his details below. He's also independently funded, so we can all the help we can get. Taylor, I'll see you in May. Hopefully you'll be out here for a few weeks, and then we can have a bloody big party in June. Yes, How about that? let's hope for it. Thanks very much. Thank you.